。那今天晚上呢，非常高兴再一次请到了一个我们很高兴和很 favor 的 student， 呃、uh, ，you know very student love him so much， he's like big brother to them， 哈、huh? ，Kevin， Kevin 他是一个二十三年有个非常丰富经验的一个。Undergraduate school 和 graduate school 的一个 college application counselor 啊，所以他有二三年的经验。他还 specialize 在什么呢？他非常 specialize respectful to the student uniqueness 和 strength， 同时帮助他们发现他们的 unique strength。因为您知道我们在升学过程当中，很多时候中国的学生容易 cookie cutter 啊，容易我们 follow the big。那个大流，人家学音乐，我们也去学音乐；人家做体育，我们也做体育；人家去做 research， 我们也做 research。而是应该去由这样有经验的导师来发现孩子的 uniqueness。那今天晚上他的 topic 呢，也是说怎么让你的 personal statement 这个这个时候是表现你 who you are 的一个一个一个 window。那我们常常孩子非常 struggle， even。呃、uh, ，lot of students apply to 这个 Stanford 和普林斯顿这样的 college 的学生，我们依然看到他们在这个写 personal statement 的时候的 struggle， 非常 struggle。原因是我们呃华裔家庭通常不太注重日常来 asking 呃这个我们孩子的这个 opinion 啊，我们这块做的是真的是不够的啊。那么造成了他们孩子们没有习惯于做 self reflection， 也没有习惯于去 understanding how to express themselves in the You know, 六百五十个字，五百五十个字去表达他们的这个 who 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 they are。光是成绩看不出来，对吧？只能看出来你是个好学生而已。但是作为一个人，毕竟这些好学校培养的是未来的 future， 推动社会进步的社会人。所以在这一块呢，这个 personal statement 是一个 place， 很好的去展现你是不是他们要培养的那个 potential 的 student 啊。所以他的话题今天呃是集中在 how to write a unique um。让人家眼前一亮的这个 essay， 从而通过这样的一个 window 来了解你 who you are. So Kevin, ah,、uh, I just made a quick introduction about AFI. Also made a quick introduction about ah、uh, our AV Campus and you. So now the floor is goes to you. So ah,、uh, we are looking forward to hear your insights.、Mm. Thank you, Kevin, for your time. Can everybody see me? Okay, we were having a yes. Okay, beautiful. Should I replace your? I'm gonna share? stop sharing. You can share your PPT, please. Good evening, everybody. Sorry for the delay. We had a few minor technical things, and let me just open this up properly.、Um, and I want to welcome you to this. I'm very happy to be here. And whoops, wrong way. Just again. I'm still having trouble with this.、Mm, just hit the button,、uh, not the minus. Go, go left a little bit. Left, there is a uh, yeah, that one. Hit that one. Hit that button. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Um,、Wonderful. let me come down a little bit. So, folks, what I'm here to play with tonight is a really basic question. Um. There are one or two countries on the planet which really emphasize essays as part of an application process. Most of them don't actually. Most of the time, the admission structure is numerical. It's exams. It's things like that. It's the scores you have in school. And what I want to do tonight is really focus on the essay itself.、Um, I'm going to talk a bit about. Elements that go into this, I'm going to then share an essay with you from a former student of mine that I'm very fond of, and walk you through it a bit, and then analyze some basic tools that I use with students to find their essays. I suspect along the way that quite a bit of this is going to be a little surprising because you may not expect to hear what you're going to hear. Um, I may challenge a few ideas along the way, but what I'm trying to do with all of this is really just prevent present information that we use to help students get to great essays. It's easy to write okay essays, but to get to great essays, and especially if you're talking about higher levels of admissions, you really have to have something that stops people and makes them sit up and pay attention. Um, so one of the questions, you know, obviously, is how do essays help us understand things?、Uh, 
Um, and when I, what you're seeing on the screen right now, when I start working with somebody, one of the first questions that comes up is, okay, so why these campuses, why these schools, why these particular programs? Um, essentially, who are you and why do you care? And one of the big things that I find a lot is that people will give me a list of schools. And when I start to ask schools based questions, for example, why this school, why that school, get specific, please. Why do you love Princeton? What is it about Princeton? Very often what I get is essentially, well, it's Princeton. And yes, it is Princeton. It's famous for a lot of reasons. But if you approach any top school with that mentality, I can promise you one thing, you will not get in because you need to see them much more carefully. You need to pay more attention. So if this is just, I wanna to go to Princeton because I want a great job and I wanna be rich and famous and whatever it is, it's not gonna happen. Is this a love story? Is this, you're seeing this school and if they said, pack your bags today and come, you would pack your bags and go. So that kind of sense of connection is really, really critical and changes a lot. My job is great essays, um, but I'm not counseling since I do both. Um, I love, and I was a writing teacher for six, 16 years before I started counseling. So this, I've been at this for a long time and I love working with kids on writing. I love helping them find their voices, the way they wanna say things and how they can carry information across to other people. The great essays really come down to something though that's not concrete. It's maturity, it's self-awareness. It's saying to the schools, here's who I am, I know myself, here's what drives me, here's what challenges me, here's what I've done, here's what I wanna do, and here's why your school is going to help me do that in essence. So my job in the first stages of working with students is getting to know them, finding out what's really, really important, what's really tested them, where have they struggled, where have things been difficult, where have they done great things, but in this notion of personal truth, here's who I am. And my job is always, always to present students as who they are. I will never try to make someone look different and I, it's hard for me to support someone doing that. Admissions wants to know who is this kid and why do we want this kid on our campus? A small note which comes up periodically is what I call invisibility that I have to never be visible, present in someone's applications. So the writing really has to come from the student. I will help edit and shape and guide. Obviously, that's a big chunk of my work, but I'm always trying to work in the student's voice, in the student's framework. And one of the things I always say to my students as, I'm, as we're going back and forth with drafts, if I send something back to you that doesn't really sound like you, tell me and we'll adjust it. Just sometimes it happens, my voice sneaks through. But this has to be the student's work. I wanna go through a few myths here. Um, ways of thinking that I think are really not productive and can really hurt applications. As you're seeing right here, you have to impress admissions. And this means writing something super complex and intellectual for your personal statements. No, 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 no. It's not that the Complexity and the intellectual shouldn't be in there. It has to be in there, especially if you're going after top schools. And yes, if you're talking about Columbia, you've got to be highly intelligent, but you have to be personal. You have to be willing to reveal something about yourself that we don't know from the rest of your application. And that's kind of the point of the essays in the end. The application has so much information on it. We've got all your academics, your activities. We've got your letters of recommendation. We've got all of the stuff that you've done, your test scores, um, but we don't know you. And the point of these essays is we want to know you. And I remember writing my own first essays for undergrad many, many, many years ago and really trying to find what was me that I could bring to the table and what could I share that they maybe hadn't heard and that really defined me. 
So when I'm working with students, I'm really sensitive to what defines this student. So myth and mistake number one, actively trying to impress, bragging, don't. Bragging again, look how awesome I am, I'm so good. Folks, never, 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 never. Humility is what we want. And I know that seems kind of sort of may go against intuition here, that humility is what gets you into Harvard. Yes, arrogance will never get you into Harvard. I promise you. Humility is, look at the word it has in it, the same root as human. Humility is making yourself human. It's letting us see the human being. And at that point, AOs, are, you're gonna see this term, admissions officers, we call them AOs. The admissions officers are reading your application. They're reading them fairly quickly. And they're looking for points of connection, points where as AO, I recognize something here. I like something here. This pulls me into this application. Um, so why is humility important? You're a teenager. I'm speaking to your kids now. So be a teenager. And really important information that people always forget. This is not AI reading the applications. It's AOs. And these are human beings. And they work like to the death in the fall. When they're in reading season, they're reading 10, 12 hours a day, application after application after application. It's exhausting. They have good days, they have bad days. They want to like you. I will tell a story a bit later about a Stanford rep I know and something she said that really shocked me. They want to like you, so help them like you. Give them things to work with that they can grab onto and say, wow, this kid is interesting. Let's find out more. Third myth, super academic, you know, that you're so serious. No, again, humility, human, be human. Care, be vulnerable, be open, be curious, be exploratory, and be smart. But feelings matter in these essays. When people come in and write very, sort of, this is my scientific research, or this is the thing that I'm doing over here, and it's all very in a box, it's boring. It's not engaging for the admissions officers. They want to be seeing young people who are struggling, learning, growing. These essays are very much on many levels about growing up. And how do you chart that? And how do you move forward with that? So this is not so much what. And I think people often ask that. What makes the students, you know, it's, no. How strong you are academically? is everywhere on your application. We're going to know this. We don't need to have this in the FAs. At times I ask somebody, what makes you special? And I've had students say, I've got a great work ethic. I work 19, 20 hours a day. My response, as you can see here is, because anyone applying to a top school who doesn't have a serious work ethic, good luck. You probably don't belong there. So we assume if you're applying to an Ivy, Northwestern, Chicago, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, any of these top schools, that you've got the work ethic and your grades and your test scores and everything show us your work ethic. This is about you, which is to say, this is about who, not what. Who are you and why should we care? Um, as we start to break these things down, and these are all pieces that will come later in the discussion, what will you contribute to our campus? Why is our campus going to be a better place because you're here? Academics, sure, but we're also interested in culture. We're interested in service and community. We're interested in people doing creative work, artistic work personally. Um, Pitzer College in California, it's one of the wonderful Claremont colleges outside LA, used to have on the common application, the supplemental essay. And the question was, imagine that it's five years from now and you are in the process of graduating from Pitzer College, and someone gets up on the rostrum and says, we're going to tell you now why this person contributed to Pitzer and why Pitzer is a better place because this person was here. And the essay is, please tell us what you will contribute and why Pitzer will be a better place since you've been there. And my students used to look at that and just go crazy. They had no idea what to say. And it's a very hard question. How do you look ahead into your life that way? How do you imagine it? 
but it, it's a great question. And they had it for about 10 years and I was actually kind of sad when they let it go. So who are you? What are you going to contribute to the world? And one of the things you many parents may realize, but students often don't, is being an alumnus of a school, they wanna be proud of you. They wanna be able to say, ah, this student went off and is doing amazing work and they'll bring you back to campus, they'll give you talks, things like this will happen. When coming out of Amherst, there's constantly things about these people from Amherst who do amazing, amazing stuff and the school is so proud. Um, so the essays become this beautiful, beautiful chance to create context around your numbers, to get rid of the mathematical and make it human. You're gonna keep hearing me say this word. It's an invitation to be you and to invite readers into your world. And if you can do this well, you change your chances in dramatic ways wherever you're applying. I've had people in the past ask, okay, so what's the formula for these essays? How do you do this? And there is no scientific formula. There is no A plus B equals C. There's no algebraic equation here. And as much as these terms seem a little amorphous, there is sincerity and there is authenticity. Be real and really value that. And those things sitting underneath the essays really matter. I'll be coming back to this in more detail in a little while. And I just, this is a very famous quote in English. It's attributed to Oscar Wilde, the famous Irish poet and playwright, but the Oscar Wilde scholars say he didn't say this, but I love this line. Be yourself, everyone else is already taken. So stop trying to be what you're not, which happens so much in this process. So often I'm catching students and saying, no, no, get back on track. Okay, your friend did this, that's really cool. Get back on your track. We're not selling your friend, we're selling you. Here's the big mistake, guys. People often believe they are smarter than admissions. That we can do things and admissions won't figure it out. I've got news for you. Anybody thinking this, admissions officers are not stupid. On the contrary, they're usually extraordinarily bright people. Uh, the majority of admissions officers often are recent graduates from the college or university who stay on for two to three years to get experience working and experience dealing with people. Sometimes they stay on for careers, but they're really intensely bright people. They're trained and trained and trained. And if you think you're going to outsmart them, you've got trouble ahead. So see if you can, and your kids especially, if you can get out of that mindset that we're going to outsmart admissions. So when students come in and I'm using the word lie, I don't like that word, but make things up a bit, exaggerate, distort the truth. Admissions people have very, very strong radar and it takes relatively little for the alarm to go off and say, hmm, what's that? I'm not sure I trust that. And the moment someone's in that mindset, now we've got a problem and it's likely they're going to do it. And if they do sense a problem like that, as I say here, you're probably not going to this school. A few more steps in the general stuff and then we'll get directly into the essays. Allow me to introduce Jessica. She was a wonderful student of mine back in Los Angeles when I used to live there. Um, she was early in my period of doing college admissions work. And she came to me for some SAT tutoring, I think I used to do that. And we did some writing tutoring and then we transitioned into her college process. You're seeing her profile here, and it doesn't take much to explain how strong this profile is. She was incredibly hardworking, very creative, very good at what she did, and varsity tennis and biology research. And what I liked about her most, when Jessica was doing community service stuff, it wasn't, I'm checking off boxes on my college application. She was doing it because she really cared. She did various things with kids. She was teaching kids reading. She was doing other things with kids on other points, helping them with cooking and food. And one of the things that you need to be clear about is that when you get into even your essays and you're talking about community service, we can sort of smell the difference between someone who's doing this because they want it on their college resume so we can get into Harvard and someone who does it because they care. Once again, the colleges and admissions are generally smarter than we give them credit for. So be careful with this. And as you're working with your kids, 
and if I'm working with your kids, I will really make sure that the things they're doing are things they care about that matter to them and they're really committed to it. It's not to say they can't change, but sincerity, again, becomes really important. Um, let me give you the background on Jessica quickly beyond the numbers. This will help understand things a little bit more. Um, she started coming to see me and as I'm getting to know students very often, I have a long list of questions that I will start asking. Um, they're questions designed to stimulate ideas, to bring out pieces of the person so I can see them, to open up dialogue between us. And I, every student I work with, I do different questions. I sort of follow my nose on this one. The last question on the list at that point, that day, was a question I really liked. And it was, if you could change anything about people to make the world a better place, what would you change? And she immediately was like, oh my God, my friends, they drive me crazy. They're all beautiful, athletic, incredible students, artistic. This, and she was in a very wealthy community. They have beautiful homes. They have everything going for them. And all they do is complain all the time. And before I even thought what I was asking, another question came out of me that night. I looked at her and said, if you could change anything about yourself to make the world a better place, what would it be? And she looked up at me, froze, and she lost it. She started to cry. I mean, she really lost it suddenly. I'm in my office. This is back when I had a partner who was with a student on the other side of the wall. David's hearing her cry and sitting there saying, oh my God, what did Kevin do now? That student's mom is sitting in the waiting room on the other side of my door. And Jessica just has this meltdown. And I kind of knew without asking what had just happened. And when she finally settled down, she looked up and said, it's me. I'm just like them. I'm always complaining. I'm always carrying on. And, oh, God. And she calmed down. And I looked at her and I said, what do you think? And she said, I think I have an essay. Let me go home and write it. And a few days later, she brought me back an essay in a very, very rough draft. And what I'd like to do, I'm actually going to read it to you. I hope you'll indulge me on this. Um, it's a little long to try and put on the screen and make you read it, but there's going to be important things that come up in this. And I think you'll have some sense both of what a really good college essay can sound like. Um, the draft I'm going to read, I think, take a deep breath, folks, I think this was the 12th draft. It was really a long process because there's delicate stuff in here. There's stuff that can really tonally go the wrong way. So I do, we just kept going back at it and going back at it. Jessica's essay. On a dull, foggy Tuesday morning, I wake up in darkness. At 6.15, my hand slaps the table aimlessly, searching for the alarm. My mind stumbles onto the terrible realization that, once again, I got only four hours of sleep last night. Numb, I yank myself up. I'd love to sugarcoat my life. I wish I could tell you that I wake up each morning to an existentialist conversation with my parents or to a burning passion to save the blue whale. But on this Tuesday morning, I can't be anything special. I'm just a tired student with puffy eyes and a cranky demeanor. Life sucks when it's an endless string of homework, late nights, early mornings, when it's so ordinary. I laugh when I hear people talk about teenagers, these wildly hormonal angst-driven animals. If only, sometimes the worst part about being a teenager isn't the drama or the crazy emotions, it's the tedium. Later in lit class, Mrs. Varenkoff towers over me as she lectures on James Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man. Can anyone tell me what Joyce is trying to say? Anyone? Silence hangs over the room. She continues, Joyce is all about finding the sublime in the everyday, about finding beauty in the smallest 
places. During our break, I see Molly. She's one of the most perfect people ever. She's got everything. Fantastic grades, good looks, talent, charisma. She plods over to me. I'm so tired. Can you believe the homework Mrs. Tran assigned last night? It was so long. Listen, I'm really sorry. I can't eat lunch with you guys today. I have to finish the econ homework and the homecoming committee meeting got moved to lunch. God, I'm so tired. Every time she does that, it brings me down. Why does she have the right to complain? She lives in Palos Verdes, for God's sake. Honestly, if I could change one thing about the world, it would be for people like that to stop complaining. I hate how she can live this wonderful life, how she can have everything and only see what she doesn't have. I hate how her tiredness and her endless flaws completely override how great she is. But most of all, I hate how she sounds exactly like me. I turn around. In the window of Mrs. Varenkoff's room, my reflection stares back at me. Sagging eyes, unruly hair, slumped shoulders. I try to look away, but the clarity bites me. At the edge of my numbness, cracks begin to spread, threatening to knock me off my carefully balanced center. Yes, life's tough sometimes. Even the lucky of us have to struggle from day to day. I begin to wonder, perhaps it's how we face those small struggles that defines who we are. I think back to what Albert Camus in his Myth of Sisyphus said, the struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a person's heart. We must imagine Sisyphus happy. A smile plays at the corner of my mouth. My life is an endless, unanswerable question, but beautiful nonetheless. Back in class, Mrs. Varenkoff continues her discussion on Joyce. I hear a collective groan as she asks, so what is Joyce trying to say in chapter five? Again, silence. I begin to sigh, but I catch myself. You know, I actually like reading Joyce. Better yet, I like discussing Joyce. I raise my hand. And finally it comes to me, the answer to all the nagging questions. To let the struggles, the failures, and the coldness of my life become my life is not to live at all. I will not wind my days away. I will drink each one with conviction and gratitude. I cannot choose where my life will go, but I can choose to live every moment of it. As I step out of class, the crisp October weather nips at my ears. I love autumn when the heavy summer rolls over into winter. My birthday falls on Thanksgiving this year. I have so much to give thanks for. My loyal friends, my family, and yes, even the calculus test I stumbled through two periods ago. I feel somehow lighter. I head towards my next class, toward my next daily struggle. In my mind, I'm sprouting wings. This moment is eternal, hung in the balance of time. I laugh and I cry. I'm both foolish and wise. I soar. Thank you for listening to that and for your patience. One of my favorite essays of all time, something I'm very proud to be part of. Now let's move forward and start to play. And I'm sorry, I forgot to share this. This was the prompt, which is a classic common app prompt. The lessons we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. 
recount a time when you faced a challenge, setback, or failure. How did it affect you? What did you learn from the experience? You just got one of the best answers I've ever seen somebody give. So one of the things I want to call attention to, yes, Jessica did get into Columbia early decision that year. And successful applicants have profiles like the profile you saw a few pages back when they're getting into Columbia. So what made the difference? Humanity, just the absolute honesty and humanity that emerges through this essay, emerged through her other essays for Columbia. And I know she had really spectacular recommendations from a few of her teachers, including Mrs. Varenclough, whom I knew. So for essay development, I wanna take you guys a little bit inside some of the machinery that I use when I'm starting to work on things with students and starting to discover how to move through whatever, excuse me, the subject is, whatever the student wants to get into, whatever they want to explore. Um, and I have what I, I, this is something I kind of came up with, God, 20 odd years ago, 22 years ago. There are four qualities that really define, for me, great college essays. And I'd say in some ways they define great human beings. Um, objectivity is the first one. And when I say objectivity, I mean the opposite of subjectivity. So ob if you're being objective, you're talking about facts. If you're being subjective, you're talking about opinions and emotions. In this case, objectivity, meaning one of the measures of maturity is the ability to step back from yourself a little bit and look at yourself a little more objectively, a little more factually, not always caught up in your desires and your fears and all of the stuff that's going through our heads all the time. So objectivity, the ability to look at oneself a little more clearly is a, a huge, huge piece in these essays and how students self-present. Number two may seem really, really counterintuitive to you, vulnerability. And I'm imagining a lot of you were sitting there going, wait, vulnerable? You want my kid to be vulnerable in the middle of her essay to the Ivy Leagues? Answer, yes. I don't mean vulnerable, I'm tearing myself apart and I'm terrible and bleh. Vulnerable, I'm willing to let my guards down. I'm willing to let you see me at a level that I may not always show myself. I'm willing to show my strengths. I'm willing to show my weaknesses. I'm willing to show my struggles and not try to hide them. And this is hard. This was one of the things with Jess's essay that took us a lot of drafts to get right. Humor, surprisingly, has a place in here. And again, people mostly look at me like I'm completely crazy. Um, there are little pieces of humor in here. And it, you know, at the beginning when she's waking up and slapping at things and just sort of bleh, all over the place, the comments about teenagers as wildly hormonal, angst-driven animals, she's got a little humor in the background. And what's nice about that occasionally is it just lets a little pressure off. What's critical is that it can only be self-directed. In a college essay, if you laugh at other people, I can pretty much guarantee you, you will not be going to any college which reads that essay. So it has to just be, I'm laughing at myself. And I can make the argument that self-directed humor is a higher level of objectivity. You're able to sit back and you know, if you ask my friends, I laugh at myself a lot, because I really actually take myself quite seriously, but I know that, and I need to laugh at it to sort of disperse it. Jessica also had that quality. Finally, as we talked before, humility, the state of being humble, meaning I'm not beating my chest, I'm not trying to prove anything. What I will say to students all the time is when you're going toward the essay, don't go over, don't get louder, don't get mm, go under. Be quieter, be softer, and let your words and your ideas and your feelings resonate. Let the reader find it, as opposed to banging them over the head. This is an incredibly important aspect of these essays. And again, it takes some time to develop and find. But once you do, you I just if I go through my archive of great essays, every one of them has a really strong aspect of this. And it's something I'm very proud about after all these years. Tool number two, I call the writer's journey. 
Um, some of you might be familiar with a man named Joseph Campbell, who was considered one of the two great anthropologists of the 20th century. And Campbell was most famous for a book called Hero with a Thousand Faces. Campbell was fascinated by the fact that, and he spent 35 years traveling all over the planet into some of the most remote areas. He went and found tribes no one had ever found in South America, in parts of Asia. And he was fascinated by humans' tendency to use storytelling to teach, to pass on lore and knowledge and understanding to help people develop. And he, this book was about the notion of the hero's journey. This is if you know King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and they go off looking for the Holy Grail. Yes, they think there's Christ's cup somewhere out there, but it really in the end is a metaphor for going on a journey of learning, of growth, of challenge. And for me, this really became a key way of talking about what makes these essays sing, meaning the student, if you go, if you're looking at Jessica's essay, you see her go on this journey. And the actual structure that Campbell uses is very complex. I'm not going to do that here. Um, but as a way, I always take my students through this as we start to talk. And this technique evolved actually from uh, before I was doing college counseling, I was doing SAT verbal, and I was also doing a lot of English class tutoring, and people constantly were having trouble with understanding really complex things in literature, whatever they were reading in school. And eventually I began to realize what they were struggling with was not what's the importance of the symbol of the rose in the scarlet letter, but why the people in the scarlet letter are doing the things they're doing. Who is this about? What's going on? And once I began to realize that, I began teaching them this as a tool for literature, and very quickly it transitioned into a tool for college essays. So, who is the protagonist of the story? When I say protagonist, most people think the hero. But no, the protagonist is, yes, the main character. Yes, it's the person we have the most attention on, usually. But more importantly, it's the person whose journey we're going to follow the most closely. It's the person who's trying to move somewhere. And usually we're hoping that he or she gets there. And there's a lot of struggle getting there typically. So whether we're talking about Star Wars or much more serious drama or comedy, the protagonist is always an element. Where is the protagonist ultimately trying to get to? Actually, let me back up for a second. So who's the protagonist of the story? Let me keep this in the college frame. Who's the protagonist of Jessica's story? Obviously, Jessica. So the student is the protagonist. The question is going to be what happens. So question two, where is the protagonist ultimately trying to get to? What is she or he trying to face, accomplish, resolve. So if I look at Jessica and it's like, where is she trying to get? At the very beginning, she doesn't know. If you watch a movie, if you read a book, the protagonist at the beginning never knows the whole journey. The journey evolves as we go through things. She just wakes up and life is, you know, she's tired, but bit by bit by bit, and thanks to Mrs. Barenkoff, she sort of gets pulled into this confrontation with herself. And that becomes the journey. Three, who and what is standing between the protagonist and the achievement of these goals. As you know, we call this an antagonist. Antagonists are, you know, that could just be the bad guy. In Star Wars, Darth Vader walks in, he's seven foot tall, dressed in black, head to toe. Pretty clearly he's the antagonist, he's the bad guy. There are then more subtle antagonists um, in the Scarlet Letter in certain novels. The antagonist, I would say 1984 as well, the antagonist is actually the society. And it's an individual conflicting with the society. But in the end, the most meaningful and complex antagonist is always going to be the protagonist herself. Jessica is fighting. Yeah, she's pissed off at her friends. They bug her. She's fighting with Jessica. So in most sophisticated literature and storytelling, the real antagonist is the struggling side of the protagonist. Big question, how much is the protagonist prepared to pay or sacrifice to achieve his or her goals? How hard are we willing to work? How hard are we willing to fight? Looking at Jessica's essay, how deep is she willing to go into her discomfort, into her habits, into her tiredness and all of these things? And if you actually have this essay in front of you, you watch 
slowly in the second half after she goes through, but most of all, I hate how she sounds exactly like me, you watch light begin to creep into this essay. It's one of the things that's most beautiful about it. Next to last paragraph, I feel somehow lighter. How much has she paid to get here? She's sacrificing everything in the way she's been relating to the world. She's really making a shift. Question five, success or failure? If it's success, we have success here. She makes it. Failure of a protagonist is what we know as a tragedy. So any of the Shakespearean tragedies, for example, the protagonist always fails. She succeeds. The most important question, though, of course, is the last one, which is, what does she ultimately earn, learn and bring back from the journey? How does she develop and grow? Folks, come back to what I said earlier. This is the question of college admissions and personal statements. So almost always these essays involve some level of challenge and growth, wrestling with something inside, outside, whatever it is, and a sense of growing, a sense of developing and becoming a bit more mature, a bit stronger, a bit sharper, a bit wiser, a bit funnier, whatever it is that the person's dealing with. So when you put the four qualities together with the writer's journey, excuse me, which is how I work in the first stages of an essay with students, this is where we find much, much better pieces of writing. And one of the really fun things from where I'm sitting is when I watch a student who was kind of struggling with, what am I gonna write for these essays? I have no idea. And then a month later, we're looking down at something and the student's realizing, oh my God, I did that? Really? And there's sort of this growth happening in the writing of the essay. It's not just that the growth is life, but the writing itself of this kind of thing tends to develop students. There are times where I have watched students really change in very concrete and radical ways as we've gone through this process. Starting to conclude, number one rule, there is a magic formula, a scientific one or a mathematical one, and it is quite simple. Passion is contagious. If any of you sat through my LAC presentation back in the spring, you heard me talking about this. If you are writing and you are passionate about something, I will tend to lean up into it. If you are writing and you are bored, I tend to sit back, which is where we're going next. Um, so find your passion. Boredom, indifference, lack of real investment, also contagious. So it goes something like this. Admissions officers sitting in front of your application can sit up or sit back. And I had a wild experience many years ago when I still had my office in LA. A student brought me a draft of an essay and I started reading it. And I'm a, you know, a couple paragraphs in and I glance up and he's looking at me and he looks terrified. And I'm like, what? He's like, you hate it. I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I wasn't loving it. I don't think I was hating it. I hadn't noticed that I had kind of slumped while I was reading it. And that was the day I learned I had to pay really serious attention to my body language when I was working in the same physical space with students. But passion is contagious. If you are passionate in your writing, we will all generally lean into your writing. Is this not what you want with admissions? Admissions readers are human beings. This is what people continually forget. When they're in season, again, they can be reading 10, 12 hours a day. They're evaluating thousands of apps and they have to say no to so many amazing students at the end of the process. And I know AOs and they'll talk about, you know, I had these three kids this year. I thought absolutely these kids are getting in and they did. And, and she was kind of depressed because she, these, these kids were so good and it, it was, they were as good as anyone else. They're just, the numbers and the positioning and the subjects didn't work out, but they're human beings. And we have to always remember this, make sure your kids understand this when they're writing. Why do they choose such a challenging job? They love it. And here's this Stanford AO I met years ago and we were talking and I was having, it was a period where I had like two years where I was just had a bunch of people applying to Stanford and no one got in. 
her name was Gloria and we were having lunch and I'm just like, all right, give me a clue because my students are getting creamed and we've been working together all morning. So she kind of knew me. My students are getting creamed, why? And her clue was everybody thinks people like us spend our whole day saying no, turning our noses up, you're not good enough for Stanford. You're not good enough for Stanford. She's like, that's not why we're here. My whole life is about finding the next great kid. There is nothing that makes me happier in my job than that. And then I have to fight for them. But this is really a core to college admissions. They love what they do. They're, they don't, you know, they get paid okay, but they're not getting rich. This is not a Silicon Valley job. This is not a Wall Street job. They do it because they love it. And you have to remember this. Finally, and this is for the students, but I guess for the parents also, have fun. Have fun doing your applications. Have fun doing your essays. If you're having fun, there's a much better chance that the rest of us are having fun. And that, folks, is my presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm going to give it back to Sophia and turn off the share. All right. Thank you, Kevin. That was wonderful content. I just not too sure if the uh, attending student or parents um, able to stuck in the uh, content and information you are sharing. I really like the one you reading the uh, student essay. It was so much emotion, so much, uh, and and also your background of uh, theater. Add a lot of layer in there. You were like performance. I was watching a performance. That was wonderful. Yeah, because if I'm reading that essay, I might not able to read so many uh, nutrition in there. It's it's about um, you know how the people and the reader if they can understanding and bring their own emotion and background, and maybe they can take away different things, right? Absolutely. And I also know this essay very well and I know the person, so I'm coming from Yeah, there. that makes huge difference. Okay, um, so uh, family students, if you are listening to that, uh, do you have a questions? Would you please able to put a question in the, in the chat box or maybe, um, yeah, and also I agree, what a, what a beautiful article, right? And also, if you're able to, um, uh, uh, and um, hold on one second, let me also share my screen so I can uh, go into a, a, a question. Uh, yes, totally agree. What a beautiful article. And, um, you know, a Kevin will be able to help you kids to have enough time to thinking deeply about who they are. Um, I think a lot of parents are misunderstanding about what personal statement is going to uh, perform in that whole application uh, portfolio. Even now, uh, even now we have other consultants are coaching students and the students are struggling. Struggling even now it's into the mid of September and we're not able to provide anything on the personal statement. That's really difficult. You know, sometimes the, 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 the student is a student. You know, sometimes they just stuck. You know, they have good things, but they just need someone to help them pulling them out kind of thing. And um so and that process is not easy. Mm -hmm. Yanni just asked a question about a class that came and went. Mm -hmm. um, someone named Yanli, do I have a class? Which uh, Yanli, right now the answer is I'm not teaching classes. I'm working privately. But so if I wanted to throw that question to you. Yeah. Yeah, we can uh, discuss about that. Um, right now, uh, obviously, Kevin, like he said, he has 16 years. Okay. Uh, is the number correct? 16 years of teaching. English writing, right? Before I right. Yeah, yeah, English writing before he become a independent college counselor. You know, later on work, uh, mm -hmm. he's with our team right now, mainly as a independent U.S. college application. Obviously, he's so he's able also helping uh, applying for you for England school, uh, UK school as well. Uh, but uh, uh, Kevin's main job right now as a coach consultant for Ivy Compass to helping entire package applying, uh, applying for colleges. Okay, so parent student continue through your question into the chat box and we will go by one by one. And also if you wanted to have a dialogue with Kevin, uh, feel free to open up your Mac or raise your hand. I will be able to give the you know, floor to you so you can have a question expressed more clearly. Sometimes question is harder to put in writing, but maybe it's better to ask in, in human. That way you can have a dialogue with Kevin, right? We still have a time. And since we have a, you know, a little bit more time tonight, 
uh, you can ask in question lively. Um, then, you know, also student, I encourage you to open up your mic to ask a question. If you are in the middle of doing that uh, as a senior applying colleges this year, uh, you might be need some of additional help. Um, we have a lot of, you know, story on that. Um, but before we go into a Q&A, I also wanted to do a, you know, one of procedural things, right? If you are wanted to get into Ivy Campus WeChat group to continue to receive our monthly presentation like this, to share different kind of knowledge with you, you scan the barcode on the left-hand side. That way, our system will be bringing you into our WeChat group. So you will continue to receive valuable information like this. But if you wanted to see if you're like ninth grade, 10th grade, or 11th grade, if you wanted to see if a Kevin is the right person to help your kids to grow, to become who they are, to understand you who they are until they apply in senior, you can scan the barcode on the right-hand side. And then me and Allison, we will be follow up with you to schedule, help you schedule a 101, 90, uh, 90 minutes, 30 minutes of free consultation with the parent, okay, 30 minutes. But sometimes he's kind of, he might give 45 minutes, okay? So we have enough time to have a one-on-one -on -one only for your kids to, for you to evaluate and see if Kevin will be the right person for you to help your student, mentoring your student and your child throughout the high school, you know, sensitive year. So scan the barcode on the right-hand side that we, we will receive uh, that inquiry, okay? We will uh, arrange that. So I'm gonna leave this here and then um, is is uh, let's jump into the the question. Um, uh, let me see if it's a lot of question. Okay, let's go from backwards. Okay, um, question from uh, Harry Duan. How do you deal with the situation if a prompt of the supplemental essay from a college is a similar to one of the topic of personal statement in Common App? What do what do you do, Kevin? So I, I is what you're asking. The prompt is similar. They're, they're usually not that similar, and you have to distinguish. You have to separate them. You can't copy or echo on any serious level. Um, you have to be really, really careful with that. So, if you're looking at a prompt that's asking for, tell me about your favorite extracurricular, and then you're looking at a, a personal statement that's extracurricular oriented, I would be cautious there because it's A, it can look lazy. And there's a certain common sense aspect of at times trying to recycle prompts from school to school if you're very, very careful. I do this, but I do it very carefully. Um, but at the same time, if you come off looking lazy, you're in trouble. If they feel like you're trying to take the easy way out, I would then choose another prompt. You, what you basically have to do is line up all of the supplements, have them in front of you, see what's there, and then look at the personal statement prompts. And yes, I would much rather a student go for the prompt that inspires him the most. I would rather not go after a prompt that inspires less, but we have to be careful. Sometimes we can modify a supplement. I, I can't give you a specific answer you know, here without really having the thing in front of me, but I hope that helps a little bit. Right, okay. Um, do I hear Kevin sometimes um, some of the consultant uh, distinguish the two is personal statement is more talk about just what you said about you personally, like who you are as a person, as a human. And then supplemental essay more focusing on the future uh, desire of learning in what subject, almost like why us, sometimes why us uh, uh, supplemental essay is more towards to student wanted to focus on what type of area and then providing more of further research or further study in that field, right? So there is a slightly difference of focus. There's a great variety of, of supplements. So yes, I think probably the why do you want to come here one way or another is the most common. And those are nice because if I'm working with a student and they have three or four of those, I'll always start with the longest at one school, develop that, and then there are pieces you have to be very careful. There are pieces we can sort of carry across. And we have a saying, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time if yeah. you're very, very careful. The danger here, of course, is if you carry one detail from school A to school C, they'll know it by by school C, you're in trouble. So it has to be handled very, 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 very carefully. Good um, point. Very good point. 
Yeah, very good point. I also heard sometimes consultants are saying um, it's better to do one, just what you said, uh, emphasize that as parents. They usually, sometimes parents are saying, okay, I'm going to ask my student doing four school at a time, which is I, I hear from consultants saying not good idea. Just like what you said, it's better to complete one good school, one good school complete. And then sometimes the second, the third, and, and fourth school will be much easier because some of the idea can be adopted sometimes. It has to be done super carefully. And also, if you're doing early decision, early action, you're finishing those schools first, obviously. But when I have students doing that, like I do right now, I'm always looking at what we're doing and kind of keeping one eye on the rest of the applications and trying to just prepare so I can take stress off the student if possible and be more efficient. But that takes really careful guidance. Again, there are lots of traps in there. Right, right. Okay, makes sense. Okay. And Audrey, you're asking, can you get a recording of this? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, usually about one week um, after behind the scene, we have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, our staff working on the recording, editing. Once we have that, if you are in our WeChat group, we'll, we will be sure the recording link in our WeChat group, okay? So make sure uh, you are in our, one of our WeChat group. If not, uh, you can connect with me and I will be make sure you're going to that group, okay? I'm going to put my, um, hold on one second. I'm just going to put on my um, WeChat here, just in case um, if you are, you know, want to make sure you have a copy recording, then you can, uh, I will be make sure you got a copy of that. Okay. And also, like I said, our website always have pass all the coaches uh, uh, recording and presentation. You can go in there to review um, and also watching if you wanted to. Sometimes parents asking for PPT, but PPT content are belong to IP of the uh, consultant like Kevin. So usually we don't ask for that, but you are able to by review the recording, able to take a look at that screen, you know, they take a screenshot or some some sort, you'll be able to review what the key content and, uh, and the uh, key information you wanted to get out of it. Uh, obviously we're doing this, we want to benefit in all the families and students. We want to make sure you get something out of this presentation. And obviously in along the way, if you feel, you know, hire somebody like a co uh, Kevin as a coach, benefiting so much, not just college application. It's about growing. It's about finding who, who they are. It's about a mentorship. It's about you have a child in the high school period, very sensitive period. Sometimes parents, uh, by your nagging about the message, you want the kids going to a best school, may not work, but then you can hire somebody like Kevin. You know, their message you deliver is so much more, so much more easy to sink into your kids than just you try to be, you know, nagging about your your, your kids so much more uh, efficient. Okay, so that's a side benefit. Okay, I, I, call, I call this side benefit. And um, Yan, Yan Li uh, asking about Kevin had a class. You know, uh, as every compass as company, we always wanted to hosting a PS class. Uh, we always want to do that. We just did not find a time or uh, enough, you know, consultant time to do that. So this is a good idea. Uh, we're going to make sure we execute. We're going to have a conversation with Kevin, see if Kevin has a time, maybe hosting throughout a year, maybe one or two workshops um, to that way the student, um, let me tell you, if if the student able to do a personal statement in the ninth grade, 10th grade, by different level of maturity, I guarantee you by the time in the senior, they will have so much more easier time than just quickly jump into a senior then we see struggle throughout the board. That's struggling. I still have a I still have a student right now, like I said, cannot write a personal statement in the middle of September. You know, we're like, if you don't write, we're not able to help you level up. So you have to give us something. The consultant cannot write for you, right? Ultimately, it's not a Kevin. It's about your child is who they are, okay? So class is a good idea. So stay put, stay put. Um, again, um, let's talk about it, okay, uh, Kevin, maybe it's a good idea for us to do, to, to do a class like that. Okay. Um, do you like to tutoring students for English? Yes, absolutely. I think we can talk to Kevin about that. You know, it's all about we're in the service business. Um, let me discuss if Kevin has time, uh, has time to tutoring a student, but uh, something we open. 
May I ask tutoring English as an English class or tutoring English as an English language? Those are different things. Uh, that, that person can write back and let us know. Because Yes, I, I, Laura, English. Laura Zhang, you can either open up your mic and also you can write a, uh, clarify that question. You wanted to have English as class or mm -hmm. English as a language. You know, we could, let's, let's have a conversation about that, Sophia, and see. Okay. That's not yeah, that we know we do a lot, but possible. It's possible, absolutely. And 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 Laura, just so you know, again, so much of the discussion um, that I was doing with the writer's journey and all of this, that's what that was, was a technique for really helping students get through complicated literature. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I'm thinking because you have so much knowledge, it's better to, <laughs> you're better to adopt, uh, you know, uh, kind of get get out of your technique and also your uh, expertise. Okay, the next question is going to uh, come from Jane Lin. Suppose I'm writing a sort of uh, trauma essay for my personal statement. Mm -hmm. I have dedicated I have dedicated a majority of it talking about myself along how I grew from it, less about the event, but I I feel like it doesn't click. Do you have any general advice for those type of essay, um, personal drama? I, you know, strangely, if I look at Jessica's essay, this could very easily be a trauma essay if it went the other direction. It turned positive, but it's the kind of story that can go trauma. Um, th there's complexity to this question because it depends on what the trauma is. It depends on how it's being handled. Um, trauma shows up. Trauma is a big word, so I don't know if you mean trauma like really life-shaking, heavy, heavy things, or trauma is something that was just upsetting and how it's affecting you. Um, there are lots of traps in that kind of essay, honestly. I can just, it's just general things. It can become self-indulgent and what I call pobrecito in Spanish, poor me. Um, I'm suffering so much. It can become self-pity. Or it can become the trauma is kind of a launch pad to something else. How much detail you have to have in that? Again, I don't know what you're talking about. If it is something really dramatic, I think I would obviously turn the volume down a fair amount to give us, there's always going to be a question of how much does a reader really need to know in order to get this, as opposed to, I'm going to tell you all the terrible details of something that happened. I'm just thinking if I have anything in my head, I can just think of an essay recently. Not right now. Um, I've done this quite a lot. It's come up in my life and it's sort of inevitable. Um, I would just say, use a light touch, not humor, but a light touch. And I think your instinct focus on how I grew and where it took me. We're more interested ultimately in that journey because that's what's telling us if I'm sitting in the place of the admissions officers, that's what's telling us who you're likely to be on our campus, what you're going to contribute. If you come in with the drama and the pain and the blood and whatever it is, and you're carrying that toward the community, that's not so appealing. If you can say, I've been through something particularly difficult, you know, the way I would say it, actually, I'm, I'm in my 60s. And I'm one of the very, I'm the first generation of children of divorce. My mom left my dad when I was 12. And divorce was very uncommon back then. I know that sounds amazing today, but divorce was a very uncommon thing. And unfortunately, my father was a violent, difficult person, and the divorce was very ugly. And when I came to writing my, I had to write two essays for Amherst for undergrad. One of them was writing about being a child of divorce. And what was in my advantage was this is not an essay people had seen a lot because it was a relatively new cultural shift. Um, I don't have that essay anymore. I was actually looking for it last year, trying to see if I have boxes and I, I can't find it. But I just remember talking about how much it tested me, how hard it was to watch my parents fighting, to watch going to court, arguing about money, just all of this awful stuff. And my dad was rough and my mom ended up sort of being the victim in that case. And I was much closer to my mom. But in the end, it was me and how I was trying to find my way through this and how I was trying to grow from this. It was incredibly painful. My brother is seven years older, so he was kind of away and my brother was a bit of a drug addict at that point so he was just drowning it he wasn't dealing with it and I got stuck in the middle so 
it was less focused on, oh my God, this is so awful. My father's such a jerk and my mom's suffering so badly and they're fighting. And it's, I mean, I literally had to like pull my dad off my mom one day. He was getting so violent. Um, I was like 15 years old. This is not something you want to have to do. I don't think I wrote about that. But it was just more the sense of watching my family fall apart and how do I find me and hold on to me? Maybe that's the way I would say it. I hope maybe that helps a little bit. Um, and that's a, it's a tricky essay to write. And that essay is not as, functional now because divorce is such a common thing. So I hope that helps. Hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Yan Li, uh, you asked me to unmute you. Can you raise your hand, anyone, if you want to have a direct question asking and a conversation with Kevin, please raise your hand. Once you raise your hand, I will be able to find you. I will be able to unmute you and to allow you to have a conversation. Okay, thank you, Yan Li. Okay, let me ask one more question, then I'll unmute you, okay? Um, the question about that is, um, saying, um, let me see, there is a, let me see, how do, uh, what kind of question would you ask students to ask? Okay. What kind of questions would you ask a student to help them brainstorming idea for a personal statement? That's a good question. That's a long list of questions. <laughs> and yeah. Partly, partly it, the, the answer is what I start doing first is talking to the student and getting to know the student and finding out where their areas are. And then once I know a little more, sometimes students already have an idea. Again, the question that I asked Jessica that prompted this essay was from a long list of questions that I keep. Sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't need to. They're sort of open-ended stimulation questions. I don't know that, I mean, you know, again, if there's one thing you could change about the world to make the world a better place, what would you change? If there's one thing you could change about yourself to make the world a better place, what would you change? Gosh, I'd have to pull them up on the computer. I haven't used them in a little while. Um, it's, it's getting the scent, and I'm using the sense of scent, like the trail of something, um, getting the scent of a student when I'm starting to talk to them and then beginning to play with things and knowing that an awful lot of what I start with won't land, won't be right. And in the process, I'm sort of carving away the things that don't work to get down to the pearl that's in the middle, which I will always find. Sometimes it takes more work, sometimes it takes less. Jessica, it happened very quickly. We did 12 drafts of this essay. It was a long work process, but the, the essay dropped in quite fast. Many times in exactly what Sophia was just describing, it can be going into late September where within a month of ED and a student is really struggling with finding a personal statement. At that point, I'm going to start, I may just start giving writing assignments, and I wish I could give you a specific answer to that. Um, it, to me, it's very much situationally dependent. I need to have the kid a little bit in front of me and have a sense of what's going on. But I think if you were to ask some of the questions that you know I asked during the talk, what's most important to you? What would you really like sacrifice for? What would you give something up for? What do you need to learn? What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished? Where have you been challenged? What has been hard? Where have you learned something really unexpectedly? You're walking down the street, you're minding your own business and something happens. You know, We all have had this at moments and you suddenly have this, oh, I see something, I get something. I was walking, there's a hiking trail right outside my apartment. Two months ago, I was walking and some guy came around the corner and just came walking up to me and said, so what do you got to say for yourself today? I think he was a little cuckoo, but it was just, oh, I'm, I'm a poet also. And that ended up becoming a poem over the course of the month after that. I actually had set something into motion and I used it. So ask questions, look to stimulate. And this is harder for mom and dad sometimes because it comes in via mom and dad. And there's all kinds of resistances we often have to our children. Um, start dialogues. If there are other people in the family, friends, things like that, get them talking and just sort of play with it in a gentle way. Sometimes you have to trust that you plant a seed and it doesn't flower immediately. Sometimes I'll see this with students where we talk about something in July and it comes back in September. And there are even times where it's like, oh, oh, right. I just had forgotten about it. 
And that's amazing that somehow the seed got planted and it just took a little time and stimulation from other things. So I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Yan Li, now the mic is open, so uh, feel free Thank to. You. Uh, mm. Thank you, Sophie. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we okay. can. Thank you, Sophie, for hosting this wonderful workshop. And thanks, Kevin. Um, I really loved uh, to listening to uh, Jessica's essay. Uh, <laughs> the tone of voice is the dream of, uh, I would like to hear my son writing something like that. <laughs> but he's an eighth grader. Uh, we really, um, I'm really seeking for a writing tutor or writing class that, that can help students who is not comfortable to express their feelings or touch uh, the soft parts of themselves. Mm -hmm. so and it's harder, um, harder, often harder for boys than for girls too. Yeah, I wonder if Kevin has such experience to helping uh, such students to bring their own voice, their true um, feelings out into the essay. Is your son a reader? He loves to read. He's he, really? yeah. Because when it, when you when I get a young person, especially a young boy, he's not that young. But I mean, boys who are not readers, it's often very hard to get them to talk because we're not socialized to do that as men, as young men. And so talking about feelings, talking about delicate things is sometimes hard. I think I was very, very lucky to be kind of my mom's son. And my mom, I had more permission to, to be emotionally open. My father would just, you know, would get violent with that. It was terrible. Um, do I, have I done this work? Yes. Is this something that we're doing right now? I mean, again, this goes back to Sophia. And what's interesting with this is you guys are really, a number of you pointing out things that are needs. And I think there's gonna be a conversation about how we maybe can meet those needs. Am I open to, you know, whether your son belongs in a class or one-on-one -on -one is hard to say, I don't know him. Um, sometimes if it's sensitive kind of stuff, one-on-one -on -one may be easier. Um, mm -hmm. And it really will depend on how you feel. So I would say, maybe talk to him and see if he wants something like that. And we'll have some dialogue on our end, and then you can reach out to Sophia, and we can see if we can put something together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I you know usually I love starting if I'm doing college counseling. I love starting in tenth grade. Um, it's just the perfect time, and in tenth grade, at the beginning of that year, let me say it this way: if you come to me at the beginning of twelfth grade, there's a limit to what I can do because the pieces are already in place. The structure has already been built through high school. I get a 10th grader, I can start to have some role and guidance in all kinds of choices along the road. Um, so I like going younger and I love getting someone in 10th grade who I'm gonna be with for two, two and a half years and really work all the way through to the admissions process and see what happens. Um, for your son, it'll just depend on what you want, what he's ready for at this point. Um, and yeah, I think we can probably talk about something like that. That's kind of intriguing. I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah, I hear, um, I thank hear you. your point. That's why I mentioned if at eighth grade, I mean, at this point, I think we're seeking for a class, a small class, or mm -hmm. if you don't hope for a class, we're, all, we're sure. also open for tutoring. Um, but again, I feel like, you know, it's a good time to nurture the ability to write. I think it takes time for writing than it is for, you know, logic mathematics you are yeah you are so uh long vi vision parents i i really proud of you for that i i love that because i think as chinese family we are not so used to helping the growing child to express himself too often that's not our culture that's not in our culture you know i'm sure a uh, us family is a little bit more open but then you know not every family doing that so in that sense you are so I, I, I'm I really appreciative of what you try to express here. Eighth grader is absolutely wonderful time to start and think about this. That's why I said as a Ivy Compass, um, we always think about, we've been talking about this last year. I just have not found a time to ask in one of the consultants because they are so busy of doing the college counseling work. Uh, none of them are, they, they just so qualified doing the personal statement coaching. We have not able to find anybody able to hosting a workshop on this subject, you know, we are working on that. So uh, Yeli, you you bought a great, uh, uh, you know, area point. 
um, we are going to serious, think about maybe if it's not a Kevin before we, I was asking for somebody else doing that, but now maybe we just, you know, can have that dialogue with Kevin and see if he has time. Like I said, uh, let me emphasize, Kevin right now is heavily working on the whole package. So somebody, they are asking us, um, is Kevin doing one-on-one? Yes, he does one-on-one. He's solely doing one-on-one right now, helping the student from the ninth grade. Matter of fact, he has a couple of ninth grade students right now. He's coaching to along the way, helping them to grow to a B, uh, you know, person until the seniors. Then those kids he will know for two years or three years will be wonderful for him to helping that kid put together uh, along the way when they're seniors. So Yanni, yes, um, good suggestion. Um, maybe you can add on my WeChat. Uh, we can talk about this and I can have a conversation with Kevin. How we do doing this one-on-one or maybe a small group, um, you know, lesson to starting talk about, you know, essay type of personal statement would be a great way for them to get used to it. You're right. Thanks, Thank Sophie. You. Thank you, Yang. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Like I said, okay, great. Yanli, I, I, I love you. Raise your hand. Ask me a question directly. So any other parents and students, feel free to raise your hand. Then I can unmute you. You can have a conversation with the cabin directly and also express your question in a little bit more detail. But let me go back to the chat box. Uh, one of the questions coming from XA. My child is ex obsessed with military history, specifically with armed vehicles, but he wants to study engineering. Is a good idea to write about this passion. Uh, if uh, in a nutshell, a social science study, a social science student at heart going into a STEM. What do you think, Kevin? I don't think I. You know, generally speaking, it's what you do with the subject rather than the subject. And there's, <laughs> excuse me, there are limits. There's certain subjects we're not going to touch, obviously. Um, Go back to the thing that I talked about sort of toward the tail end. Passion is contagious. If he's passionate about it, I, I just know the number of times a student puts an essay in front of me about something I have no interest in whatsoever. And I'm reading this essay and suddenly like, oh, that's kind of cool. Wow. Teach, tell me more about this. Go. I want to learn more. So military history is great if he wants to work in that. Um, if he wants to work in actually, you know, work in the military or work in construction, engineering, things like that, there are a lot of pathways that go through that. Does he write, can, actually, can I ask what year is he right now? Is there a quick, quick way to answer that? You can even just type a, type a response if we're not in. Yeah, right. XA, can you type how old what, is your child right now? What year is he in school? 11. 11. Okay. okay, this is great timing then, yes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's no reason not to, it's going to be a, less a question again of what he does than what he does with it. That's, that's, that's what I would come into the room with is, okay, what point do you want to make? Where are you taking us on a journey? When college essays come into me, again, on things I know nothing about, and I'm just like, this is, this is one of the, you know, I, my friends who are AOs will say, this is one of the real fun parts of that job. You read about everything at some point. So if he's passionate and he can write about it in a passionate way, and he can teach us about, if he's doing this for a personal statement, he can teach us about him through military history, him through whatever the specific things are. That's interesting. If it's going to be an essay on military history, that's not a personal statement because it's not personal really anymore. That's the one thing I would offer right there. Okay, next question from Sandra. When do you think my kid should start brainstorming the essay? How early they can start as we don't want to rush it? Any suggestions in timelines? Can I ask same question, what year is your child right now? Sandra? 11th grade also. Yes, yeah, start playing. Uh, you know, understand that brainstorming is brainstorming. Brainstorming is exploring. And there are times when I have students where we may brainstorm three, four ideas before we find the idea that really, you know, the word I didn't use tonight that I often use is the idea that sings. I always want essays to sing. You heard an essay tonight that sings. It's really, there's a voice there and it comes through. Um, so I would say just start ideas and keep a log of ideas and see 
what rings the bell? What excites your child the most? There's you, know, you can tell often when a kid is talking about a topic, there's like, okay, I'm interested in this and this is kind of cool and this is kind of cool. And this, and you can sometimes just hear the energy, the chi shift immediately in the midst of that. Um, so it's worth experimenting and trying to find different things. So yes, by all means, start now and play. And emphasis on the word play. Let it be play, not so much discipline. Explore ideas, keep them, see what happens. And sometimes you just keep peeling away layers and suddenly underneath there's something you didn't expect. Sometimes that's the discovery. Or sometimes the thing your child does right now turns out to be a personal statement next year. It really just depends on the kid. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to echo your question as well. Uh, some of our consultants starting doing the essay in the second semester of 11th grade, like meaning they starts in February and March. And some of the consultants are starting in July 1st. They're hoping using July and August to help the kids finish the personal statement by the end of uh, August. So different consultants have different ways or timelines. But let me tell you something. Seriously, by two months, your child sometimes feel rushed because in that two months, they cannot think about personal statement only. They have a lot of other things to do, right? Because the summertime, you have some kids have SATs. Sometimes some kids have other research. Sometimes kids have volunteers. So the time are rushed. And, and many, many often we feel a lot of times the student have one idea. They feel is not resonate. The parents often behind the scene telling us saying, oh, let me support you this document. Oh, let me, you know, the, the kids writing this before. You know, my student, my kids are writing this. And they often behind the scene feel their kid's idea is not a interesting enough. So there's always a struggle of the kids will not listen to the parents. The parents all often feel the kids does not landing on something. So they're struggling and they go in that complex of communication going through our consultant. And our parents sometimes were writing an email, give us a whole bunch of things and hoping us to read through. And guess what? That doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. So, so a lot of times I feel the earlier, Kevin, to starting a essay writing, especially personal statement, much better. The earlier, the better, seriously. And, and you know, let your child explore. And whether you're coming in to us or someone else and working with somebody, if your child comes in with several ideas on the table, this doesn't happen often with me, but when it does, it's like, okay, this is cool. Let's see what we've got to work with. And sometimes it's one of those ideas. Sometimes it's like, okay, let's talk about this one. Let's talk about this one. Let's talk about this one. You know, I'm not sure that any of the three, it's what I'm getting back from the kid, from the child. I'm not getting the kind of fire, the kind of passion that makes me, again, sit up and really listen. So we've got some foundation and then we keep exploring. And very often right after that, we'll find something that does bring all the pieces together. Somebody was just asking a question about a 12th grader. I think I just saw that. Yeah, go. we do. Um, actually, we do. We have a, in the past, in the 2023, we, we have a one or two writers. Uh, they are only working on essay coaching. And so uh, I believe I can talk to Kevin about that. Uh, I believe we just need to have a more meetings. Um, it's it's not, if you're looking for something like really cheap package, uh, Kevin is not that coach. Kevin is very senior. And so if the parents are looking for, you know, something on the street, uh, like $3,000 or something, it, it's not that kind of package. So we need to talk about that. Um, Kevin, if you, um, that's also Kevin, the parents are also Kevin, me. If you add my WeChat, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, like I said, uh, either Kevin or we have somebody else doing that as well. If Kevin able to do that, if you like Kevin, um, we can talk about it. I can give you the price about uh, what's needed to for him to have a multiple meeting quickly with you to speed the process. So Kevin has to have a time able to really condense, maybe have like three times a meeting uh, in a one week, turn around time will be quicker. Because obviously we don't have a lot of time. We're fighting with the time. So Kevin, I would love to for you to connect with me and I will talk to Kevin about what's a package uh, he's able to offer in such a short period of time. And then we gonna provide it to you, propose to you if you see if it's working or not based on your family situation. Is that okay, Kevin? Kevin me? I'm saying Kevin me, okay? So connecting with me and uh, like I said, I will express that package with, uh, with the Kevin coach and then let him... Uh, 
you know, propose something to you, okay? So to see if it's working. 